stay standing, let's pray, okay? Father, we thank you for a song like that that brings a little heaven down to us. And we believe that Jesus beat death, and we believe that he beat it for us, and he beat sin by bleeding and dying for it, that we may not have to pay the cost. And you have declawed and defanged our worst and last enemy, death itself. Because Jesus speaks a better word with better blood. And so we are here this morning to celebrate eternity in the Lamb. God, would you fill us with hope and would you help us to rivet our attention on you this morning, we pray. And we praise. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Why don't you have a seat? Man! Kind of hate to have to follow that. <laughs> Listen, today is Vision Sunday. We're interrupting the parable series for this announcement. And we're going to talk about looking back and we're going to talk about looking forward. As a family, we're going to kind of celebrate what God has done in the last 12 months. We need to understand, here at FBC, we don't work on a calendar year. We work on a ministry year from July to June. So we're just wrapping up one big ministry year and we're about to launch into a new one. So we're going to look back and then we're going to look forward, celebrating what God has done in the past. And letting our faith be stretched as we think about the future. And we've put a pile of rocks here, a pillar of rocks on stage. And everybody's supposed to say, what's that there for? What's that there for? Funny you should ask. This is to help us look back and to help us look forward. And it comes from a story in the book of Joshua, chapter 3 and 4. So if you brought your dangerous books, that's where we're going. In Joshua chapter 3... The Lord gave Israel's new leader, Joshua, strange marching orders to prepare to enter into the Promised Land by crossing the Jordan River. While their enemies were watching from the walls of Jericho, he said, go through the river when it's at flood stage. Doesn't seem like very wise counsel, but it was God. So they did it. And it was funny that God said, the priests are going to lead the way. So the priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and they're walking towards the waters. And by faith, they actually have to put their toes in the water. Ooh, it's cold. Now I want you to push the pause button. Because 40 years earlier, something similar happened. They were stuck before this big, large body of water called the Red Sea. The Egyptian army was chasing them. And then God split the sea in two. And two and a half million liberated Jewish slaves walked through the Red Sea on dry ground as the water closed in behind them and cut off the path for the Egyptian army that was trying to kill him. But, that generation's dead. And now a new generation has been born in the desert and they need a new faith lesson because they didn't see the Red Sea and so God's about to give it to them. And we, let's, uh, it's with that in mind that we're going to pick it up at verse chapter 4 of Joshua and pick it up at verse 1. And this is what we read. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan River... The Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests stood, and to carry them over with you, uh, and, and put them down at the place where you're staying tonight. So they were going to pick up four big, 12 big muddy boulders, one for each tribe, right out of the riverbed where the Ark of Covenant was standing, and where God had stopped the Jordan River and where they crossed. And they were going to carry them to their first camp and set them up as a pillar like this. You get the picture? And what it says here is it says, yet as soon as the priest... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed something here. It says uh, in verse 6, it says, uh, let's go all the way back up here. It says, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of Israelites to serve as a sign among you in the future. And when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? You tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So every time they see that, oops, every time they see that pillar, they're reminded of the past, what God did. Now go to chapter 4, verse 20. Joshua chapter 4, verse 20. Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones that had been taken out of the Jordan. That's the first place they camped in the Promised Land. And he said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, What do these stones mean? You tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground 
For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we crossed over. Look at verse 24. He did this so that who? All the peoples of the earth. That's not just Israelites. That's El Grovians as well. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the land of that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. We have this pillar here as a reminder of what they did so that people can look back and also so that people can look forward. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look back at what God has done. We've got a praise wall. We're going to call you to that in just a little bit. In fact, in your po programs this morning, you've got a little post-it. So let me just tell you what we're going to have you do with that post-it. In about 15 minutes, we're going to have you scribble. Well, you can do it in the next 15 minutes. Scribble down something that God's done in your family or in your life or in this church in the last 12 months where you want to just say, praise God, and you're going to celebrate that. And then in the middle of the service, we're going to have a, a praise song, and we're just going to post it on the blue walls. Okay, let's just cover the walls up, all right? So you've been forewarned. But let's, let's go back to Israel crossing the Jordan River, and let me give you principle number one this morning if you're ready to fill in the blanks. Okay? We are told to look back, not go back. We are told to look back, not go back. At the Red Sea and at the Jordan River, Israel passed through water and God cut off the route of escape. They couldn't go back. They weren't supposed to go back to Egypt. They're not supposed to go back to the desert here. They are to look back for encouragement, but they are to move forward in faith. God history is meant for encouragement, not for paralyzing nostalgia. And so the invitation here by God is, is that we would celebrate what he's done in the past, but we'd be, be, be very careful about thinking about the good old days. In fact, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 10, we are told, do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. So let's be very, very clear. For God and his people, these are the good old days. This is the day the Lord has made. Not yesterday, not yesteryear. This chapter in this church's history and your family's history is supposed to be your finest hour. Let's remember that. These are the good old days. Can we say that? These are the good old days. This is a little difficult to say, but I want to say it anyways. There are some people that are tempted to hide in the past and in the glory in the shadows of the past, but there is no safe place for you and I to hide in the past. There is no safe place for us to do that. Things change. Cultures change. People change. Challenges change. El Grove has radically changed in the last two decades. Our church has to change. We change. Only God remains the same. Everything else changes. So as we look back, we do so to celebrate God's presence and His power, His goodness, His blessing, protection, provision. But we will never seek to go backwards as a church when God is moving forward. It's not wise to drive forward while you're looking in the rearview mirror. We will move forward. So our faith goals for the future are going to be different than anything we've ever pursued in the, in the past. Just, just know that. But let's, let's take a little bit of time to look back and celebrate what God has done in this faith community over the last years. I want to just say, first of all, we have been blessed with a very wise, godly, sacrificial, capable, courageous elder court. We also have a very good, hardworking staff. And this church has a solid core of committed Christian servants. And that is great building material for a great church. And 12 months ago, you secured a missionary pastor. And you can pick your friends, but you're stuck with your relatives. I'm Uncle Scott, so hi. Nice to meet you. But I think we've got the building materials now to, to see something wonderful happen in the name of God here in this church. And so I believe these are the good old days. What's happened in the last 12 months? Well, let's just talk about a debt. Uh, back in November, we owed $1.42 million for facility upgrades of the past. Let me interpret that for you. What it meant is we had a ball and a chain around our ankle and we weren't free to pursue any dreams God would be planting in our heads or hearts. We were stuck. And so we started the Double Our Impact campaign where we had the nerve to say we want to expand our kingdom influence instead of retreat. And today, we, of, of this $1.42 million, we've already raised and paid back $1,058,702. It's already paid back! <laughs> 
There were some that doubted. They need to go into the boo box. I don't, you don't. But that means we still have about $362,000 to go to just finish that debt off. But we have made phenomenal progress. And the good news is the, the, the $362,000 is here too. It's just still in your wallet. So we're going to work on that. The second thing that God has done through this church in the last 12 months is we've secured a much better financial position. When I first got here, I discovered that we were so overstaffed and we had so many expenses that we actually were paying salaries with our line of credit. We were actually temporarily borrowing money to pay salaries. And that's just not good enough. We needed to trim staff. We needed to get a little bit of a reserve fund. If there was an economic hiccup like what happened in 2008, we didn't want this church tanked. And so the, the leaders of this church very, very wisely are securing the foundation so that we can serve the Lord faithfully until he comes back, not until next spring. So that's a very good thing to do. But all of that is really in the name of something more important. And it's to make sure that we stay on mission as a church. Uh, we just secured a better future to do what God has called us to do, and that's to make disciples. And so we have gained great clarity and made great progress with God's help in the area of discipleship. Uh, let, me, let me give you an, an example. You know, if you own a business, probably your bottom line is you want to make money. But this is not about money. This is about life transformation, this church. It's about changed lives. And quite frankly, Jesus has clearly given us our marching orders. Before he returned to heaven, after raising from the dead, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, I want you to go and reach all nations. The word he uses there is ethnic, which means ethnic groups. Newsflash, they've all come to Elk Grove. We don't need to travel very much to obey this command. I want you to reach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And I promise I'll be with you to the very end of the age. That's what Jesus said was our marching orders. And he promised presence and provision if we do it. So, regardless of how you say that, what we're in the business of is making more and better Christians. Collaborating with the Spirit of God in evangelism and discipleship to, to, to have more people discover the life-transforming love of Jesus Christ. That's why we exist. So this last year, we went through the exercise of actually defining and getting better clarity because we wanted to know what we would have if we got what we wanted. So we defined disciple. You ready to fill in some blanks? And I like the definition that we hammered out. It took us about three months. But the definition of disciple is this. A disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is a person who continuously learns to live and love like Him and leads others to do the same. You will notice four L verbs. A disciple of Jesus is someone who continuously learns to live and love like him, Christ, and leads others to do the same. Learns, live, love, and lead. And with that, we came up with what we call a pathway to discipleship so we can lead people to greater maturity, spiritual maturity. And we call that pathway by four words, connect, grow, serve, and reach. I want everybody to say those words with me. Ready? Connect, grow, serve, reach. So right now I'm going to talk about the progress God has given us as we develop disciples with this paradigm in mind of connect, grow, serve, and reach. Now connect means connect with God through faith in Christ as well as connect with a, a, the body of Christ through church membership. So this last year, 150 people crossed the line of faith and trusted Christ for the first time. 98 people were baptized, and we had 146 people complete the membership process around here. Yeah, well, let's praise the Lord for that. Back in, back in February, we had the largest membership class in the history of this church with 95 people in it, okay? Uh, mostly people from other churches, but we'll come back to that. But these are encouraging signs. That has to do with connect. But what about grow? Well, we've had a lot of growth going on around here. Back in September, 550 people agreed to read through their Bibles, or at least the New Testament, in one year. So if you're one of those people, make sure you catch up if you fell a little bit behind. But that's a lot of people reading their Bibles and growing around here. Because when we say grow, we mean people that are growing vertically in their relationship with God through healthy habits, and horizontally in their relationship with other people, okay? In one another community. So to this vertical growth thing, we have people that are reading their Bibles, we have 98 people that have finished 
one of our one of our uh, courses around here. Let me let me see if I can find the actual name here. I'll get it. I'll get it. Uh, one of our growth opportunity classes. We have about 500 women that have been involved in various growth opportunities in women's ministry. About the same number of guys with our men's ministry. Uh, very very exciting to watch the growth that's taking place. But the one thing I wanted to underline here has to do with the horizontal element of growth. Uh, over the last nine months, we told you this nine months ago, that we do big well, but we don't do small well, so we want to learn how to do small better. So we have been studying and reading, researching. We sent a team to a church that does small groups very, very well. We've, we're in the process of now training and selecting leaders and host families. And in three months, we're going to launch a church-wide small group ministry called Life Groups. It's about time that we do small better. I was at my dentist just a couple weeks ago. I don't recommend you do this. Go to the dentist, I mean. Because she was busy drilling, filling, and billing. <laughs> While she said, my kid's going to come to summer mega camp. When's that? And I told her, and then she said, oh, yeah, yeah, we used to go to First Baptist Church. But I couldn't make any friends there, so I go somewhere else now. I never want to hear that again. What I'd like us to do is have a, a way that people can come here and make solid, wonderful Christian friends very quickly in a life group. And we can do both big and small at the same time to the glory of God. Because that's the way the New Testament church grew. And that's the way we want to grow as well. So if you're interested in hosting a small group or maybe being a part of the leadership training or whatever, call Melissa Yoakum or Mike Harding on staff because in three months we're launching it. Life groups are groups of about 8 to 14 people that meet in homes, open home, open heart, open Bible. Life group questions are on the back of your sermon outlines. It's going to be a sermon-based format and uh, we're going to launch that pretty soon, but I'm getting ahead of myself, so I need to knock it off. We have eight pilot groups going on right now that are already doing what we're going to launch in the fall. And they're having a great time. And we're training leaders. So uh, it's coming. Three months from now. It's coming. Now let's talk a little bit about serve. When we say serve here at this church, we mean that you discover the way God has hardwired you through gift a gift analysis and you can do that in an online survey with our church go to our website and there's a gift a gift assessment test you can take it'll give you your results but we also talk about regularly serving the Lord by serving other people here at this church because we have a lot of service needs now I want to celebrate something we have hundreds of people here at First Baptist Church that serve week in and week out so that we can do what we do. Hundreds of people. Look at the stage behind me here. Think of all the people serving our children. Think of all the people out there at the coffee bar and then hidden, hidden service assignments you don't know anything about. So can we just stop and applaud these people and thank them for serving us? They make it possible. You make it possible. And we need to release a whole army of volunteers now if we're going to double our impact and double the number of people that we reach with the message of Christ, we probably need double the servants, right? So just expect that we're going to need to expand our servants' uh, volunteer system. And by the way, we know where you live. Now let's talk just a little bit about, uh, well, let me, let me finish this thought by saying one cool thing that happened this year was we joined about 12 other churches in the Elk Grove area on Gone Serving back in April. It wasn't that far ago. Where we sent out 137 people on four different assignments and we joined other churches, hundreds and hundreds of people, at serving our community in the name of Christ. Over 605 volunteer hours just from our people alone. Thousands if you count the other churches in Elk Grove. And I hope next year we get a thousand people for this. A thousand people out. Maybe we should just shut down church for a Sunday and we should all go. That'd be cool, huh? I, we'd, we'd have to ask the pastor permission before we do that. So I, wait, I, don't, I don't know, whatever, okay. I'll probably get a letter for that too. That's fine, okay. Now let's talk about the funnest part of them all. Reach! Reach! When we say reach, what we mean is that you learn how to share your faith story with confidence and that you're involved in some kind of outreach on a regular basis because that's what a mature disciple would do. And so let me talk to you just a little bit about our church and what we do in reach. But first, there's a big opportunity we shared with you this morning and it's about mega camp. We're going to have within about three weeks hundreds of living small human beings on this campus. 
that need all kinds of volunteers. Many of them from the community are unchurched people too. So if you'd like to volunteer for that, we'd encourage you to do that because that's going to be, there's a reaching component to that. But I want you to know, 15% of our annual budget goes towards local, regional, and global outreach and missionary work. Did you know that? We support financially 48 missionaries or mission organizations at taking the gospel to the whole earth because Jesus called us to take the gospel to the whole world. That's a pretty cool thing to be able to do as a church, but let me give it to you. Let me bring it down in bite-size uh, terminology. During the winter time when it was really cold, uh, during winter sanctuary, we helped house homeless people here at our church at Christmas time. Uh, let me, tw we gave $12,000 away to earthquake relief in Nepal when their country was struck by an earthquake, okay? Uh, we just gave $24,000 to the food bank, the Elk Grove Food Bank here, as they serve hundreds of families that wouldn't have food otherwise. Uh, as, as they were shocked. They thought we were going to give $5,000, and they started crying when they saw the check. By the way, it's really fun to spend your money. Thank you. Uh, but uh, I just want you to know that Marie, who heads up that ministry, and we helped start Food Bank, too, here in Elk Grove. But Marie told me, she said, uh, you would not... You would, you would be uh, amazed at how many seniors are coming to us now that don't have enough food for survival. And we're a part of that. We gave $27,000 away this year to help rebuild three churches in the Philippines who had their buildings destroyed by a typhoon in 2013. We finished the first building, just sent greetings from our church as they dedicate that in about three weeks. They've started the construction of the second building, and then they're going to start the construction of the third. That's something God did through First Baptist Church. Very, very cool. You can be a part of this. Listen, we had short-term workers go out throughout the world this, this last year. We've sent people out to, um, I'll find it. We've sent them out to Jordan, El Salvador, Cameroon, India, Alaska, Peru, Mexico, the wild city of Los Angeles, uh, Uganda. We've got people all over the world. We have a church that's actually having ripple effects around the globe. Look what God can do through people. This last year, we partnered with national pastors in India to reach the Ansari people and saw 158 people come to faith in Christ and be baptized just in India alone. This last year, we, we helped commission the Embodens with crew. We, we helped to commission the, the Johanna and Joel Spicer with Frontiers. We were involved in Camp Barnabas and Love, Inc. We got another team of 20 ready to go out to Camp Barnabas again this year. There's a lot of stuff going on. Think about the 1,000 caregiver uh, kits that we did for Uganda. We helped build a medical facility, and we just sent 20 people to Uganda as evangelists, and they're ripping up the pavement there. Uh, they, they're getting into schools. They're leading people to faith in Christ left and right. And they're, and they're writing back. I don't know if you've been following their blog, but it makes your skin crawl. These are our people. You can do this. This is what God's doing through our church. And it's pretty exciting. Harvest Festival back in October. We saw about 4,000 of our neighbors come for an alternative to Halloween. We served them. We're reaching people. Uh, and I want to say something, just a, just a brief little note. Don't want you to get mad at me. Promise ahead of time, you won't get mad at me. But I want you to know that uh, as we continue this conversation about a name change, I'm really happy about something. I'm happy that it gives us permission to ask the question about why we exist as a church. Because quite frankly, Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost. And he invites us to join his mission. And I think that we'll continue this name change conversation. But really the bigger issue is why do we exist as Christians in his church? And the answer is if he was just going to save us and nothing and we had no purpose, he'd take us to heaven right away. But he's left us on earth to seek and to save the lost, which forces the issue. We must continue the name change issue if we're going to reach the lost. Let me talk to you about other spiritual fruit here. I want to say that this church move forward for a long period of time without a senior pastor and that is a credit to your staff and to your leaders and to a great church that you did so well in the absence of a senior pastor. I want to also praise the Lord that we have like the biggest Awana program in the universe or at least Northern California, you know. Come here. Yeah, did anybody involved with Awana? You know this, right? 550 kids every Wednesday night. 
plus volunteers were embedding the Word of God in their little bodies, right? This is exciting. And, oh, oh, I forgot to tell you. We just finished our modulars, too, and we're going to move into them this month. Anybody happy about that? Okay, so get your post-it notes, and we're going to praise the Lord. Where's our musicians? Get back out here. Run, Joel, run. Everybody watch Joel Newfield. Run, Joel, run. And what we're going to do is we're going to sing a song of praise. And as we're praising the Lord, we want you to march to a blue wall and put your praise celebration note, whether it's your family or your own life or this church, and only in the last 12 months. And we want you to come to the wall as we're praising the Lord and celebrating what He's done in the past. Okay? Call to the wall.
You can be seated. Now it's time to talk about the future. Looking forward. And looking forward can be a little tricky because nobody, uh, nobody has a crystal ball. But I do want to just say, as we look forward, let's remember something as a note of caution. So sometimes the biggest liability of a local church is their past successes. For example, in the 1990s, this church moved to this location, doubled in size almost overnight. People were moving into Elk Grove. A lot of transfer growth occurred. Those days are behind us. Those were great days. That's a lot of growth. But we'll probably never experience that kind of uh, population growth again in Elk Grove. So I think God wants to do a new thing. But let's be careful about just resting on what happened in the past instead of looking to God for something big for the future. It is never safe to drive forward while you're looking in the rearview mirror. In Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul kind of sets this theme. He had all kinds of ministry successes, and yet he was always moving forward, leaning into God, saying this. He said, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Even in the Old Testament, the, 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 the prophet Isaiah, as a mouthpiece of God, was speaking to his people and they were so caught up in what had happened in the past that he wanted to draw their attention to the future by saying these words, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you perceive it? I want everybody to say the expression, new thing. <laughs> new thing. Could God do a new thing? Yes. Wait, wait, that was very wimpy. Can God do a new thing? Yes. Is God alive? Is God still powerful? Is God still in control of the universe? Of course he can do a new thing. Anchored deeply in God's word and in his presence and his love and his faithfulness, his blessing, his guidance, his power, his provision. Let's expect God to do a new thing as we look at our own rock pile and look backwards at what he's done. Let's lean into God for a better future. These are the good old days. I want you to think for just a minute back to Israel. They've now crossed the Jordan River. They're no longer on the east side of the Jordan River with the protection of the desert. They're now in the promised land. They're now just at the doorstep of Jericho and all the ground rules have changed. Think about this. No more Moses. This guy that had been their leader for 40 years died on the other side of the river. Now they've got to follow this new guy named Joshua. This church has been led by a lot of great pastors in the past. But I'm not Ron Norman. And I'm not Don Loomer. And I'm not Jason Whalen. I'm Scott. And it takes a while to get used to the new guy, right? But I think God has a great future for this church. I really do. Another thing that the people had trouble with was is there's no more manna. You may not have thought about this, but manna fell from the sky, free bread from the sky for 40 years. As soon as they crossed the Jordan River, there's no more free bread. They go out the next morning to collect it. It's not there. God says, oh, I changed the rules. You're going to have to go collect your food and then grow it from here on out. What? No more free food? Let's go back to the desert. No. No. And thirdly, you have to think about this. Uh, there's no more calm, unthreatening desert. They're now surrounded by enemies. More numerous, more powerful, better organized militarily behind these huge walls. The, the, the Jewish people are definitely outnumbered and uh, the military superiority is definitely with the Canaanites, not with the Israelites. All the ground rules have changed. Yet God wanted them to move into the future and take the promised land. And this is one of the finest hours of Israel. When it looked like it was going to be a bad time and it would be in a great time. But all the ground rules have changed. Can you imagine how they would want to go back to Egypt? Want to go back to the relative security of the desert? Want to go back to Moses? Want to go back to the free bread from the sky? And the predictability of the hot summer days out in the desert? And yet God said, retreat is not an option. My people are not cowardly. My people follow me in faith and move forward. And by the way, let me just state this categorically. You and I were designed to live in the promised land, not in the desert of defeat. We were designed, designed for the promised land. But they were going to have to fight to get it. It was theirs by inheritance, but they were going to have to fight to get it, which leads to principle number two, which is that nothing good comes in life without problems, struggle, and sacrifice. Nothing good comes in life without problems, struggles and sacrifices and challenge that's why God sends problems struggles and sacrifices our way again 
if the Israelites were going to get their rightful inheritance, they were going to have to fight to get it. Here's a few things that are clear about the future. God is alive and well. We are his people. Jesus bled and died to purchase this church, so it is his church. And we can do most things through Christ who strengthens me. Us. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Okay, you either believe that or you don't believe that, but I actually believe it. And we know that it honors God when his people listen to his heart and follow his lead into the future, which leads to, to principle number three. And I've already said it, but I'll say it a different way. Everything we do as a church must align with our God-given mission to make disciples. Because Jesus has already given us our marching orders. We don't need to figure out what our mission is. He's already told us what our mission is. More Christians and better Christians. We do that individually. We do that as a church. That's our job description from our God. So with that in mind, thinking about what God did in the past, let's talk about the future because we're going to continue on with a couple of things. What I'd like to see us do is in faith, stretch ourselves and actually finish paying off our debt by the end of this calendar year, by December 31st, 2015. We have $362,000 and something left to go. We have a number of people that have made pledges to the Double R Impact campaign. We've upped a little bit in our budget about paying that debt off. We just want to be free so we can pursue new visions from God. If you give faithfully or have pledged to the Double R Impact campaign, please continue to give. If you've not pledged, give anyways. <laughs> Let's just finish this debt thing. And you're going to see in just a second why this is so important because we're stuck with another problem until we do this. Okay? Number two, we're going to continue to improve our financial position by continuing to develop healthy margin to safeguard the ongoing ministry of this church. We ask our families to live with financial freedom and margin. We're going to continue to build up some capital replacement funds and some reserve funds so that if there's an economic hiccup that we face, it won't topple this church. Because it was pretty thin last year. and We don't want that thinness anymore. But those are all excuses to do what Jesus has called us to do, and that's to minister and make disciples until Christ returns, which is why I want to talk about number three. This is the stuff that makes me salivate. And it's to invest heavily in discipleship. Not really in a financial way, but with manpower, woman power. Invest in discipleship. And I'm going to cheat. And I'm going to take the Connect, Grow, Serve, Reach paradigm, the pathway to discipleship, but I'm going to do it in reverse order because I like to save the best for last, okay? I don't know about you, but I always save the cherry on the Sunday at the side of the plate and eat it very last. So let's start with Reach. What is our vision for the next 12 months with regards to Reach? I would say it is to solve our wonderful capacity problem. To solve our wonderful capacity problem. For the first time in 12 years, our church has started to grow in the last nine months. We're up 8% in attendance. 8% in attendance. That's a good problem, right? Turn to your neighbor and say, we got a good problem. But it is a problem. Let me tell you why. Because church leaders across America know about the 70-80 principle. And what that means is, is once a church service gets to about 70 or 80% capacity, people start experiencing a level of discomfort and many of them will stop coming. Okay? And we have been, now it's summertime, so we're thinning out a little bit in summertime, but don't, don't be deceived. Back at, when we get to the end of December, vacation is, or end of August, it's over, and we're going to be back full again. We have been past the 70 or 80 mark over 50% of the time since January. We need to create another worship service, and we need to renovate a chapel to do it, to get some kind of a video venue or something, some kind of a, a sort of a, an informal kind of church service where we have 300 or 400 more seats. Otherwise, we're going to start sending people away that God has gifted us. That's why we need to tempestuously pay off our debt so we can launch another service so we can reach more people. We have a really great problem. And we need to solve that capacity problem. Let me talk to you a little bit about serve now. 
we think about the future, what we need to do with service, we need to organize and develop a church-wide volunteer system. If we're really going to double our impact and reach double the number of people that we're reaching with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're going to need to double our volunteer servant quotia to pull it off. And so what we've done is we've actually created a new position, which is a, a volunteer organizer, so that we can actually identify positions that need filling. We can recruit people. We can train people. We can equip people. This is something we're going to develop over the next 12 months. And I just want you to know, we now know where you live. There's generally, the principle in America is, is that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Well, what we'd like to do is become a biblical church. And according to Ephesians 4, all members of a biblical church are serving the church. All of them are in works of service. Not some of them, all of them. So if you want to be a disciple here, that means Jesus came to serve. You want to be like Jesus, you should serve. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45. Now let's talk about growth. We already told you this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but we're going to successfully launch and grow our new life group ministry. We've been praying about this. We've been developing it behind the scenes since September. We're going to do small better. We're going to create a ministry structure where people can enjoy solid Christian friendships and practice one another community as described in the Bible with open homes, open hearts, open Bibles, with a sermon-based format. So if you like doing life together with other Christian friends, Life Group is coming and Life Group is for you. Eight to 14 people meeting in homes. My wife and I are already starting to create the people that are going to be a part of our Life Group. This is going to be a great, great new chapter in our church. But I do need to issue you a warning, okay? And the warning is this. That if you sign up for a Life Group, it will stretch you. You might find yourself liking people more. You might find yourself caring for people more. You might find yourself praying for people more. You might find yourself being tempted to obey the Word of God more consistently. You might even be tempted to stay awake during the sermon because the questions are sermon-based. So there is a cost involved if you get involved in life group ministry, but it is well worth the trouble. Just wait, this time next year, this whole church is going to be changed by this. You'll see. It's a, it's a great, great challenge, and, and we look forward to doing that. But let me save the best for last. Let's talk about Connect, okay? And when we talk about Connect, the big vision challenge for us is to raise the evangelistic temperature of FBC. Raise the evangelistic temperature of FBC. Some people say, wait, wait, didn't you just say that we saw 150 people trust Jesus for the first time this year? Yep. Can I tell you folks that even though that might seem high to you, it's pretty low for a church this size. But didn't you tell us our church is growing? We're up 8%? Yep. But I encourage you to come to one of our membership classes and study the actual facts about this church and you'll have an eye-opening experience. You see, since about the 80s or 90s in this church, if you go back and do your homework, this church has grown primarily through church transfer and not through evangelism. In other words, this is a church very good at reaching existing Christians, not so good about reaching the lost. And we need to be honest, church. If you take a Christian from this church and put them in that church, there is no net kingdom growth. We are going to begin to stop stealing from other churches and to start stealing from the devil. Amen. I love saying that. <laughs> Jesus Christ, his mission statement was that he came to seek and to save the lost and if we're going to follow Jesus, we have to follow his mission. Right? Let's read these words together. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And we're told in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses starting at home. They were in Jerusalem starting right there. We're here at Elk Grove starting right here. 
This is a big deal to raise the evangelistic temperature of this church. This increased emphasis on evangelism. It's going to pull the trigger on a number of issues. So let me tell you what it doesn't mean and then I'll tell you what it does mean. It doesn't mean we're planning to dumb down the gospel or become a secret church. That's a false dichotomy. Yeah, there are thousands of church declaring faithfully the word of God and that are extremely effective evangelistically. We will become one of those churches. Number two. What it does mean is, is that if you really are praying and planning to reach lost people, you better know who you're talking about and make adequate preparations for it. And I've done some homework with Elk Grove, folks. And I want you to know the Elk Grove of 20 years ago ain't the Elk Grove of today. God has exploded this city. And if you do your demographic homework on who's here, you'll have a wake-up call because it's nothing like it used to be. The Elk Grove that we are surrounded with today that we need to reach is young, it is ethnically diverse, it is relatively unchurched, and it is full of families, particularly young families. And so if we're going to reach the Elk Grove of today, we need to reach. Primarily, we're going to be reaching young, unchurched, ethnically diverse families. Not exclusively. We still want to reach singles and seniors and everybody else, but pay attention for just a second. Because, for example, young, uh, the average age here in California, the median age is like 37, 38, 39, and Elk Grove it's 34. This is a young community. The ethnic diversity of this community is mind-boggling. It's one of the highest in California. It's one of the highest in America. Remember when Jesus said, reach all ethnic groups? You don't have to travel far anymore. They're here. They're on our doorstep, right? And by the way, a church that's like the face of the place is wonderful. Because that's God's bouquet. And so that's what we want to shoot for. Unchurched. Over 50% of Americans attend some kind of a faith community. In Elk Grove, it's 37%. It's less than 37%. This is a fairly unchurched area. 100,000 people in Elk Grove alone are Christless and headed for an eternity without God. Unless we raise the spiritual temperature around here concerning evangelism. That's not good enough. And then when you do the demographic studies, the biggest wake-up call is, is that in a normal California community, the percentage of family households is decreasing. It's down around 60, 50 percent. In Elk Grove, anybody want to guess what the percentage of households that are families is? 80 percent. We have one of the bizarrest and coolest cities in all of California. It's chock full of families, and most of them are young families. So, even though we want to reach everybody, the center of our reach target needs to be young, ethnically diverse, relatively unchurched families. Are you with me, church? Because if you really want to reach the Elk Grove of today, you'll make the necessary adjustments to do it. Listen, if you don't plan on having any company and you don't like people and you don't want new people, for heaven's sake, in your house, you don't clean anything. You leave the stains on the carpet. You leave the water on the bathroom counter. Everything can be gross. It doesn't matter. But the second you pull the trigger and you say, I want a bleeding heart for lost people. I want to join God. I want, I want to see lost people come to faith in Christ. You pull the trigger on a whole bunch of issues that you must address. If you really want those people, because if you want them, you'll pray and plan for them and prepare for them as well. We have to address our name issue. The demographic I just described to you is turned off by denominational names. Period. It's time to change the name of this church. Number two, we need to adjust the way we use technology. There are expectations technologically for this target. We need to change the way we treat guests. We need to change the way we communicate. And guys, these are minor adjustments that we can make with great benefit and great results. But it all comes back to why do we exist and what do you really want if you get what you want? And here's what I hope happens. I hope this next year, that we align ourselves better with the heart of God that came to seek and save the lost. And that if his heart bleeds for these people, our heart would bleed for them as well and we'll do whatever it takes to reach them. That's what I hope happens. I have a vision for this church that's an Acts 247 vision. In Acts chapter 2, the vitality of the early church was so great, 
with their small groups, with their Bible studies, with their one another fellowship. They were, they were taking communion together in their homes. They were worshiping the Lord together. That the Bible tells us in Acts 2, 47, and the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. I've done the math. If we want to be an Acts 2, 47 church, we need to see at least 365 people coming to faith in Christ every single year. That's more than three times what we currently do. Is it possible? Yes. Okay, let me try that again. Is this possible? Yes. Church, I want you to know that I led a church of about 1,400 adults in Fresno, and we saw over 400 people coming to Christ every year. This is absolutely doable. And I'm telling you, when you have that many people discovering the life-transforming power of Christ, this church will catch fire. We'll need more fire extinguishers around here because of what God will do to the chemistry of this church. It is my prayer and my dream that we will become the finest spiritual maternity ward in Sacramento County as people are born into the family of God and begin to grow up and become contagious wherever they live and whatever neighborhood and work and school they go to. I think God wants to stretch us as a community. I think God wants to do something that's so exceedingly abundantly beyond what we maybe have imagined in the past. And my question is, is your faith big enough to hold that? And if it's not, let him stretch it. Because these are the good old days. And this year is supposed to be the finest hour of our God, if we will let him. And that's about all I want to say this morning. So we're going to call our ushers forward.